Okay. I'm Judy Clinton uh, with the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory, and I'm also a core member of Interfaith Green Network and an active member of West Cook Wild Ones. Thank you to our event sponsors. Wild Ones, a national na nonprofit, advocates for the use of native plants in the public and private landscapes to create and sustain biodiversity. West Cook Wild Ones is a local chapter that presents monthly educational programs, funds garden grants, and offers native plant sales. Wild Ones relies on memberships and donations to support activities. Thank you to all of you who have donated today for our program. The Interfaith Green Network is a faith-based sustainability initiative made up of 20 area congregation green teams and congregants, partnering with the Village of Oak Park, Green Community Connections, and Seven Generations Ahead, Interfaith Green Network is working to help make residents more aware of the benefits of native plants. While we cannot walk through the gardens this year, and especially on such a rainy day, we have created a way to share a year-round understanding of three native gardens lovingly tended right here in Oak Park and Berwyn. Our garden experts come from a range of backgrounds and interests, but they each share a passion for working with native plants that benefit the full ecosystem. Just a few housekeeping notes. We will take questions via the chat box and we'll uh, wait till the end of the presentations to address them. We're going to ask you to stay muted throughout the presentation. And if we have the opportunity at the end, we will unmute it and then we can have a nice little visit with our speakers and um, catch up with each other. Um, each presentation is about 20 to 25 minutes, just to give you a heads up. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our first presenter. Adrian Aris Fisher recently retired as sustainability coordinator for Triton College. She is on the board of West Cook Wild Ones and is a member of the Interfaith Green Network. As a steward of National Grove Forest Preserve, Adrian monitors plants and oversees restoration efforts. In the past, Adrian served as University of Illinois Extension Master Gardener and was native plant buyer for an independent nursery center. Adrian is passionate about learning how to strengthen the web of relationships and interactions among living things that constitute our ecosystem. Adrian, I'm so delighted to have you kick us off. I'm gonna hand it over to you and you'll just need to unmute if you haven't already. I'm unmuted, thank you. Um, thank you, Judy, that was a nice intro. Um, So welcome to my house. Uh, it's a little yellow house in South Oak Park. It was built in 1904 on black prairie soil. That's just some of the best soil actually in the world and pretty much everything grows on it that I, that I uh, put in it. Uh, the front face is east. The lot size is 35 by 150 feet. So it's kind of long and narrow. There are two large Norway maples on the parkway uh, which shade the front and I've lived there with my family for 34 years. So my general rules for gardening are take time to learn your space, take things in stages as you can. Um, you don't have to, and maybe you shouldn't pull everything out all at once, including turf, that is if you're not starting with a new place. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially if you're working uh, on your own, be patient and be prepared to be surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, and what you're seeing here is one of my favorite surprises, which is a spring, a early spring ephemeral that uh, comes up and then, then disappears after uh, a brief period of bloom. It's called a spring beauty. About five years ago, I collected the seed in a, in a public parkway and planted it and promptly basically forgot about it and nothing happened for several years. Uh, and I later found out that that's because spring beauty seeds take two full years to germinate. They have to go through a couple of different freeze, freeze thaw cycles. A year ago, to my surprise, the little half inch flowers appeared. And this year, bees showed up to, to uh, pollinate them. And so I'm rest assured that more more of them will show, will, will show up. They will, they will expand and, and eventually uh, fill a nice area in, in my yard. And that's the earliest flower that comes up in the, in the spring. 
in the in Earl in mid spring, this is really at its height. It's one of my favorite spots, and you can see all of the spring flowers. This is a, 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 a service fairy tree. It started out as a tiny shrub about 20 years ago. It has uh, wonderful berries that the birds and I compete to get because they're very tasty. So I have a couple jars in my uh, freezer right now to use this winter, but the birds got their share also. And what you see is uh, wild geranium, native ginger, some sedges. Uh, some of these I planted, some colonized themselves, and uh, some I bought from the West Coke Wild Ones spring plant sale. I only have a, a small layer of wood chips on the ground, and so plants are able to colonize. For example, this spring, this little uh, columbine came up, and next summer it'll be blooming. So what if the garden walk had taken place? Um, you, would, you would have seen something like this. I took a little video uh, of my yard and, on July 31st. And in the beginning, you can see that I've got some bee balm and I've got a uh, partridge pea and there's some tithonia growing in my vegetable bed. And let's see, we can take a little walk. And this is pretty much, as I said, what you would have seen. I'm an amateur uh, videographer, so please excuse. And then as we come around, you'll see the flocks and you see the prairie plants in the distance, including the cup plant. You see the burr oak that I planted about 15 years ago. And then you see on the north side, uh, an area where I'm starting to do some serious native plant gardening now. So I'm gonna focus on the south side, which is my, my fullest, biggest garden area. This area goes all the way straight back from the alley, all the way along the side of the house and into the front to the service berry. Uh, spring ephemerals appear first. And one of the earliest ones is bloodroot, which is a beautiful white flower. And it comes out just in time for the earliest, earliest butterflies um, who might be out searching or bees to, to find um, good nectar resources. And that's one reason I never put away, I never rake out my leaves, I don't clean them out, I leave the leaves. Because not only do many species of butterflies overwinter in the leaves, they insulate the soil and help the plants and also uh, a lot of people don't know that firefly larvae also overwinter among the leaves and then they come out in the spring and they uh, turn into adults and the delightful fireflies we see. So when people uh, either rake and bag their leaves in the, in the fall or they come out with their uh, leaf blowers, uh, it, it's, they're sort of murdering fireflies and fireflies are in decline. So, so really, it's really good to leave, to leave your leaves. Now, during the spring, what does spring cleanup look like in the native garden? Uh, we practice chop and drop gardening. In other words, in, we've left up the stalks all winter long and they've gotten to some crazy angles. And then when new growth comes, uh, you chop the, chop the stalks off at about 15 inches high. Now, I don't throw away those stalks or, or I don't put them in, my, in a yard waste barrel. What I do is I scatter them around the garden uh, in different spots and where they slowly decompose and help keep the soil healthy. But in the meantime, any bees that have overwintered in the stalks will come out and live out their life cycle as well. And bees, and the, this summer's bees will make nests in the, in the stalks. In addition, raking, again, is not necessary. No matter how messy it looks over here, all of this uh, material will, will eventually um, uh, decay into the soil. The other thing that I'm very rigorous about in the spring and, and as long as I can be is weeding. Uh, I have certain weeds that I uh, struggle with, including Creeping Charlie, and uh, I think bindweed has probably grown in this area since it was a prairie. And so I'm very, I'm very diligent because later the plants grow up so much that you, don't, you can't even get in to do, do much weeding. So one of my favorite bushes, and I'm going to be highlighting various bushes today, uh, is 
the black chokeberry. And it's, it's a very nice four season bush. The berries persist over the winter. It has early pink buds. When it, le it, when it uh, flowers, it's another early resource for bee species, which is very helpful at that time of year. And then the berries that um, form in the, in the summer form a, make a good sort of late season snack for the robins and other birds who are fruit eating. Another favorite tree, and this is in the middle of the south bed, is the My Pagoda Dogwood. This is another wonderful small four season tree. So if you don't have room in your yard for a, a, great, tall, um, a great tall maple or oak or whatever, you can use smaller trees and they'll, they'll do just fine ecologically. Um, so in, again, it's four seasons, it has beautiful fall color. And since this is May, underneath you see wild violets, uh, celandine poppies, native ginger, there's some, a little bit of flax coming up here, and there's wild geranium, uh, Christmas fern, and uh, there are numerous other species also. I have about, oh, 120, 125 species growing throughout the garden, and that's not including my, um, my weeds, <laughs> my non-native species. In, when I'm gardening, my basic technique is to encourage naturalizing and then edit as necessary. Uh, native plants are wild. They want to propagate. They want to find places where they're comfortable growing. And it's good to garden with these tendencies. So my expectation is that plants will move around. In the beginning, I would put the same plants in different places because I wasn't sure where they would survive. And this became a deliberate technique. Uh, recently, I read Larry Weiner's really good book, Garden Revolution. And he calls this technique um, using the plants as mother plants. And my garden also now has rhythm and repetition, which are uh, great garden design concepts because of this. I also have placeholder plants. The common violets, of course, come in everywhere that you, you know, whenever you're not looking, there they'll be. Um, but they also made a great ground cover as I was slowly growing and buying natives to put in. Uh, and they mix in with the celandine poppies and the wild geraniums and everything else to create a really nice understory, sort of a living mulch, if you will. Um, and then when I want to put in uh, some kind of new native plant, like this year I put some small Solomon seal under the pagoda dogwood, I just pull out some of the violets and their space and I, I put the, the other things in. So they're really kind of a, a nice overall plant. And the celandine poppies, the same thing. They propagate wildly, so you can take some out and put something else in anytime you want. This is my bur oak. Uh, I attended a, a, a propagation workshop, oh, 12 or 15 years ago at Possibility Place, came home with a very small seedling emerging out of an acorn, and I planted it. And to my delight, it it took off and grew. It grew faster than bur oaks are supposed to grow, so that was great. Uh, and it's now become a tree that, like Doug Tallamy talks about, has, I don't know, it supports, I haven't counted, but four, he says four or 500 species of um, insects. And of course, the birds love that because they need the insects for, uh, for energy and to feed their young. So I feel that I'm, it's, it's already making a great contribution. Okay, so in early June, I, uh, you see here, this is another video. I had to go away uh, for an emergency. And when I came back, I looked with despair at my, uh, this area. This is where I start plants. I have a cold frame. It use, I grow vegetables. You can see where I have uh, started something. I always cut off um, milk containers and I use those for starting containers uh, and the netting that I, keep birds off seed, so it's kind of a mess. But let's see what, it, what the garden looked like in early June. And you'll notice uh, there's uh, shrubby St. John's wort. There's not much in, in bloom right now. Uh, in early June in the native garden, there's often kind of a quiet time because the spring plants are done, the prairie plants haven't started. Uh, and so it's, it's a very green and lush time of year. Now you'll notice that I have uh, some non-native plants over here. I am not a purist. I usually say um, 80, 
80, 20 percent uh, is great if you can do 80 percent natives. Uh, Cook County itself has uh, half, fully half the species in Cook County right now are non-native and only a handful are truly invasive. So I planted those peewees long, pe peonies long ago and they're a wonderful plant and they don't bother anybody so I've left them. The nepeta, which is the purple you see, is a flowering plant that is very useful as a bridge plant because it blooms when other things don't. And um, I wonder where that came from. The, the, the honeybees particularly like it. They uh, then leave a lot of the native plants alone, which eases the pressure on the native bees. So I always have some of that around just, just to keep the honeybees happy and, and help the native bees in that way. Okay, so this is later in the spring. And, and of course, the point of these presentations is layers in time and space. And so here are some, of, some prairie, some savanna and prairie ephemerals that, that show up, they bloom well, and then uh, they disappear as the taller plants come in. So over here, I've got violet wood sorrel, which is kind of a rare plant. And then over here, I've got the delightful shooting stars that just make anyone who sees them happy. Uh, there's sedges, there's golden alexanders, and, and when these go dormant, everything else just really starts to take off, as you'll see. But the structure is also, uh, a good structure for a garden should be uh, trees, understory trees and shrubs, ground lawyer plants, and vines. Uh, and the garden space extends into the sky and down under the ground because of the roots and the soil ecosystem, which you also want to keep healthy. And the structure is four-dimensional, so, um, so through time you also see this, this wonderful progression and, you, and you, want to, you want to have that. You don't want to have just one, uh, one two-week period in your garden when everything, everything looks good. So in, in, there's also a progression of blooms and you can see how everything is filled in and it's hard to believe that this was that, that kind of barren, gruffy place where there were dead stalks sticking up all over the place because you can't see them anymore. And you'll also notice that it's very difficult to get in to do some weeding because everything has grown up so thickly. So that's why I'm, I'm so careful about my spring prep. Um, so you start with columbine and then you go through this progression uh, to penstemon and in the background you've got amsonia, you can't see it too well. Uh, and then you get to midsummer and beyond and you've got the bee balm and the and the, the coneflower and the prairie petunia that winds through everything. And so then, then that's when people start to think, oh, prairie plants. Um, but technically, uh, I don't have enough sun for these to, for full sun plants. So these are all plants that are more like uh, savanna plants. They're marked sun to part shade. And they do very well in uh, the kinds of light that a uh, oak park or smaller uh, areas who don't, that don't, they have gaps in sun and they have periods of sun, but they don't have full sun all day long. Uh, and here's another example. I'm kind of a plant collector uh, and I often check Illinois wildflowers and flora of the Chicago region to see what um, associates are, what plants like to grow together. Uh, and it's interesting to have two different species, two different species of bee balm here. And what I've observed that's very interesting is that different species of native bumblebees like these two different colors of bee balm. Bees don't see red, so these, the red ones will look black to them, but they're, sure enough, there's a couple species that prefer them over the purple and vice versa. Uh, and then I have another little short video of just how things look in early July. And there's the... Uh, that spiderwort, I think, has been growing in the area for 100 years since it was a prairie. I didn't plant it. Uh, and you can see how that, that same area has just filled in. And then you can see beyond the little shade garden, uh, more, more sun by the, by the house. And by the house, I have more bee balm because it just kind of spread through the yard. The, uh, Black, black, uh, black chokeberry is up here. And then I've got uh, shrubby St. John's wort, which is a really wonderful shrub. It blooms pretty much all summer and it offers very nutritional uh, pollen for the bees. 
Here's another shot of that same, the same area in late July. And these two plants here, uh, I always smile when I walk by them because the brown eyed, the sweet black eyed Susan was one of the first plants I ever bought from Art and Linda's wildflowers uh, at the Oak Park um, farmer's market long, long ago. And it survived and it has a nice smell. And then the royal catchfly, Linda of Art and Linda's, uh, a few years ago donated seeds to Triton College, which I propagated for our rain gardens with some horticultural students. And somehow uh, a couple of the royal catchfly came home with me and, and went home to others, to the students' yard, yards as well. And that's a wonderful hummingbird plant. It's such a delight to see the hummingbirds kind of hovering. And so I always, I just have these sentimental associations with different plants as well. Okay, so I'm gonna do a brief thing about the north side. Um, first of all, what to do with, with non-native plants that you don't wanna get rid of. This provides privacy, this, this Amur River maple, and it would take too long to grow something tall enough to, to, to screen the area again. So I grew a native honeysuckle up through, the, through it, uh, put my hummingbird feeder uh, next to it and I leave some little uh, dead branches about the size of, you know, just big enough for a hummingbird perch and the hummingbirds really like enjoy this area now. Um, this is another site. This is a mix of natives and non-natives. This is a place where a Norway maple fell down in a storm and I was not sorry to see it go. It had vinca around it. So now I'm reclaiming the area with Joe Pye, uh, American black currant um, flocks, all kinds of things, and I'm gradually uh, pushing the vinca back as I have time. I always do. I always gardened, kind of part time in between uh, work, volunteering, taking care of kids, taking care of elderly parents. So I never had a lot of time to do just big projects. So I've done everything in bits and pieces. Uh, I love my back porch. Uh, when we enclosed the porch to make our kitchen larger, we built a new one with a pergola, and that is a native grapevine growing over it that I planted. Uh, and at the time, I was reading um, garden books from about 1902, and, and I was learning about permaculture, and everybody was recommending pergolas with grapevines, so I built one, and I've never been sorry. Uh, this summer, there was a little... Uh, immature, an adolescent cardinal that was hanging around in the leaves, kind of peering out at me every once in a while. Uh, and uh, the birds walk around on the top. It's, it's just a fabulous um, addition to a, to a habitat garden. Uh, and down below, you will see in, in a damp area is a very nice place to put a swamp rose. And you'll see that's our rain barrel. Uh, and again, this summer, I tore out the vinca and I put in some um, uh, some burr sedges and some, you can't see it, but some golden groundsel. And that area should begin to, to fill in well. And that's, it, it's always important to try to fit the, the plant to the area. And I knew that like a prairie rose wouldn't fit here because it's a little too damp and it's not quite sunny enough. And so I put in the, I put in the swamp rose. And it, it also provides good uh, pollen for, uh, for bees. My newest little project, again, around the porch is I'm, I just smothered it with some newspaper and some, some wood chips. I always get my wood chips free from the village. Uh, and I'm debating, do I wanna put in an Illinois rose or do I wanna put in a purple flowered raspberry? Well, one or the other is gonna go in there next spring and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So we get to late summer. Uh, this is just a reminder that if you're native plant gardening, it's never too early or too late to collect seeds. This is a uh, partridge pea. I plant it in the, in the pot. I put the pot in my garage, in my basement for a while. In February, I bring it out and then I get partridge peas. And now I've been taking the seeds and scattering them in this area around here. So I'm gonna grow a whole little area of partridge pea and I won't need the, the, the pot anymore. Uh, so late summer in August, the, 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 the elm leaf goldenrods in bloom, the uh, goldfinches are mating and so they're, they're raiding, the, they're looking for seeds. The uh, cup plant has started producing seeds so they're, they're happy. And, uh, and, you, and you can see it's already, it's late summer and it's just starting 
to feel a little not quite as lush as, 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 it, as it was. And then the September comes and we've got that fabulous September light, which I always, I always enjoy and um, have become very conscious of since I've, since I've been gardening so long. Um, and then the last flowers of summer, um, the, the uh, snake root has just started blooming. They bloom through October. Uh, and the New England aster is just coming into bloom in my yard. It hasn't fully, so I got this from um, Illinois wildflowers. Uh, and it's important because there are um, pollinators still flying even, you know, even into early October sometimes, some of the bees will be out. And the uh, monarchs are still, I'm, I'm still seeing monarchs in my yard and they'll be uh, leaving for the south soon. Um, so, and then my last video, another thing, what to do with a non-native plant if you want to make it more habitat. Uh, what I did here was uh, I, I have Boston Ivy on my garage that I planted 30 years ago. I grow Cardinal Climber up through it and you can see the hummingbird just is really happy. And that's one reason. Vines are important. You don't think about it, but they really are. So, so thank you. Um, it's, it's been nice giving you a short tour. Adrian, that was amazing. And um, I know when you were preparing for this, you took, I don't know how many photos and videos. Um. A thousand. Okay. So, um, Thank you um, for taking the time to do this work, to um, share that little snapshot of everything that's happening throughout the seasons. It's really magnificent. We will get to questions after um, our final speaker. Um, so at this time, I would like to introduce our next presenter. And um, we have Candace Blank. And Candace became interested in the value of native landscaping when she joined West Cook Wild Ones in 2013. Although she had little previous gardening experience, she gradually transformed her Berwyn property from a pollinator food desert into a pollinator haven. Candace currently serves on the board of West Cook Wild Ones as membership chair. Okay, Candace, take it away. Thank you, Judy, and I'm happy to be here today to talk about my Berwyn journey, a tiny peek through the years and through the seasons. I'm starting with this picture of my front yard to show the importance of signage if you do decide to do anything in the front. Signage is important to show intent and purpose to your neighbors. So since this was taken, I've since added my West Cook Wild Ones corridor sign and my conservation at home sign and I still have yet to put up my Illinois Audubon Birds and Butterfly Sanctuary sign. So I've been in my 1912 Berwyn home for 30 years. It faces east. And you can see on the left that uh, the property is one and a half lots, 67 feet by 130, almost 137 feet. And uh, here is the house in gray and the garage in gray and the deck is in brown. And the trees and shrubs that were there are these dark green dots and everything else you can see there's all this yellow is lawn. So all I did for quite a long time was mow, mow, mow. And uh, basically my property was a pollinator and wildlife food desert. They had very little biodiversity other than the native silver maple and white pine that were there. So fast forward to today, you can see how little lawn remains by these yellow remnants here. And the little light green dots are the sh native shrubs that I put in. The green dots with the T's are the native trees I put in and the purple areas or the pink areas are the native forbs or flower beds and these two green dots with the X's are the non-native trees that I removed. So quite a difference and this this is uh, facing east so my half lot looking out my kitchen window looks to the south so just to give you an idea this is the area outside my kitchen window. And this is how the view out my kitchen window looked in April and uh, this past August. 
just a couple highlights. Um, Adrian mentioned Joe Pie, sweet Joe Pie, which you need to put in the back of your flower bed because it can get five to seven feet high, is a super pollinator hotspot plant. So I highly recommend that. But one of my favorite plants is the sweet black eyed Susan. It blooms in late July, early August to all the way through October. So it's just a great, wonderful, bright spot of yellow to always see out your window when nothing else is in bloom. Going further down that half lot, the center part of my half lot, nothing much is going on in May, but by summer, the plants get so high that they create these little secret pathways you can take to a bench or to my butterfly bench there. And this is taken of, from my back deck, that's my garage, and this is taken about a decade ago. I had some of the grass removed near my garage just so I didn't have to mow so much. And it wasn't really until I joined West Cook Wild Ones in 2013 that I and started going to their programs and I learned about the critical importance of the native landscaping. So fast forward to today, which you can see I took this in August on the right. I removed this non-native Norway maple and any other, most of the other non-native plants and I replaced it with a native oak, a red bud, an ironwood tree, American filbert or hazelnut shrubs, hundreds of sedges, and many Forbes. So before this whole process started, if you were to dig in my yard, you would find pale gray dirt, de totally devoid of life other than maybe the occasional grub eating a grass root. But now the dirt is dark, rich, black soil, teeming with microbes, full of life. My whole yard is full of life, complete transformation. So I added a few native flowers in 2013, 14, but in 2015 and 16 is when I really took a significant amount of lawn out and started adding a lot more of the Forbes or flowers. So I put in about 49 uh, Forbes. And since 2017, if you look in the lower right, I put in, I added eight types of sedges and grasses that total well over a hundred. And they provide essential food and habitat for myriads of insects and moss and birds frequent them to eat those insects plus the seeds. But what I learned from one of the West Cook programs is that sedges are also considered to be one of the best types of mulch. So the roots help retain the water and keep the heat from baking the moisture right out of the soil like such as uh, that near drought we had this summer. So I make sure that I plant sedges around each new tree or shrub that I put in. And also since 2017, I've been adding shrubs and a few trees since as much as we all love our native flowers, it's really the native shrubs and trees that support the greatest number of species of pollinators and other wildlife. So I've added 16 types of shrubs for a total of 38. And trees and shrubs grow better when their roots can communicate with one another. So they should be planted in clumps or groupings. And I don't have the room to plant groupings of trees, but I made sure that I planted uh, the same shrub, at least two or three of the same shrubs in close proximity to each other. Now the selections I chose was not arbitrary. I based it on resources I got from West Cook Wild Ones, Possibility Place, and of course from Doug Tallamy's books and lectures. So here we have Tallamy's table of selected woody plants ranked by ability to support Lepidoptera, butterflies and moths. So for example, up at the top, the number one woody plant that supports Lepidoptera is the oak family that supports 534. Well, I already had a maple, so I made sure I added an oak, willows, cherries, and the American filbert or hazelnut. And since woody plants are so important, I'm going to focus on some shrubs on my property, starting with this hazelnut. So hazelnut is ranked as a highly beneficial plant to wildlife and blue jays, woodpeckers, nuthatches are birds that eat the nuts and mammals that eat the nuts are squirrels, chipmunks, red fox, humans, and rabbits and deer at the twigs and leaves. And as you can see by my cluster of three 
hazelnuts that it does provide dense summer leaf coverage for shelter and nesting sites. And I'd love to have some nests, but it's right off my deck here, as you can see. So I'm not sure I'll see that kind of activity. The hazelnut leaves are beneficial. <laughs> Beneficial to a high number of insects, including uh, beetles, weevils, walking sticks, leafhoppers, supports 131 species of Lepidoptera, including the beautiful and endangered Luna moth. Now, so far, I haven't seen a Luna moth or walking stick on my property, so th th those pictures are taken by uh, IllinoisInsectID.com and BugGuy.com, but I get a fair amount of leafhoppers, so I, I took that little guy right there. The hazelnut in April and May, you could see the long uh, catkins. They actually start out in the fall, very tiny, and they start to elongate in April and May, and then they start to bloom. And it's hard to tell on this picture on the right, but the catkins and the female uh, flowers are in the very same branch. And the, so the catkins will pollinate the flower on that branch, and then the catkin will shrivel up and uh, go away. And then once it's pollinated, up in the upper left, you can see the flower starts to form and the fruit starts to appear. The next stage is you can see the beginning of a nut and in August here on the right, you really get to see the shape of what we know as the hazelnut. So hazelnuts are actually not nuts, they're fruit, but everyone calls them nuts. So here's the development of that nut through the different stages. And can you guess what stage comes next? The squirrel stage, of course. So I often find these little presents left on my deck. And I'm going to guess that I'm never going to be able to harvest a fully formed nut in October when they're ready. Because these guys will get to them first. But that's perfectly fine with me because they're the ones I planted them for, not me. And just a couple of weeks ago, I noticed the little catkins were starting all over again. So here you have the, they'll stay tiny through the winter and then they'll elongate again in the spring to start that process all over again. And on the right, you can see the wonderful fall color that I'm looking forward to in October and November. And now we come to one of my favorite plants, the Salix humilis or prairie willow. The willows support 456 species of Lepidoptera and they're the number one woody plant that supports bees. And in the central US, they actually uh, support the highest number of specialist bees, 19. And uh, versus, for example, the cherry or prunus family that hosts the highest number of generalist bees. So if you think about the specialist relationship a little bit, there's approximately 1,800 of bees native to central U.S. and approximately 30 percent of those are specialists. So the specialist relationship is beneficial in obvious ways. They developed the relationship over millennia to work together so the plants benefit from the increased pollination and the the insects benefit from for example they can digest the pollen better but of course with those benefits come some huge disadvantages, such as when there, are, when habitat of the plants decreases. So if there are no prairie willows out there for those specialist bees, then everybody's in trouble. So if, if my take home message for, is if you're looking for a good shrub to plant, then please plant Salix. And one of the reasons I really love the Salix, it's probably the earliest pollinator hotspot on my property. So if you see on the lower right, there's the catkins come out before the leaves come out and here's a bee. I actually took that in March. So you can be going in March in a typical cold March and there's no insects around and you don't think they're gonna be around for a while. And then all of a sudden you get one sunny day at 55 degrees or over and you walk by the willows and it's like Grand Central Station. It's buzzing with activity from the tiniest little bees and tiniest little flies to the bigger bees and the bigger flies and wasps and it's just great to see that early in the season all that activity going on. So prairie willow like its name suggests does not need to be in water or have wet soil like the other willows and it does pretty well in average soil. 
this is just in my front yard. I don't do anything special with it. And interestingly, we know that aspirin is salicylic acid, which comes from the base word salix. So pretty much every part of this plant has been used for medicinal uh, reasons since ancient times. Now I talked about the hazelnut before having the male and female catkins on the same branch, but unlike the hazelnut, the willows have their catkins on separate plants. So if you want your plants to go to seed, you will need a female plant and a male plant. And my property has two females and one male. Here's a picture I took of a bee on a male catkin. And for comparison, here's a female catkin. And once pollinated, this female catkin will fruit. So here's a picture I took on May 2nd of the fruiting catkins. And then on May 18th, it released the seeds on the silky strands that blow away in the wind. By August, it, the leaf cover is dense enough to provide habitat for wildlife. And then in the fall, you get the nice yellow color. And Another plant that I enjoy watching through the seasons is the red chokeberry shrub. So it has um, wonderfully fragrant flowers in April and May. Again, an early plant for pollinators. Here's the blooms I took in May. And then by September, the little yellow berries form. In November, they turn red and the leaves turn red. So this is a good native alternate for people who love their non-native burning bushes. So rip those burning bushes out and put in some red chokeberries. December, the uh, fruit will persist through the winter and all the way to April when at least 21 species of overwintering and early arriving migrating birds will eat them. And I snapped this picture through my window of a cardinal eating the berries in um, April. So it hosts a lot of a lot of bees, many other insects, 29 species of butterflies and moths. Now some people might say, well, I see the birds eating the berries and my non-native shrubs, so why do I bother getting natives? If they're eating the berries, it must be a good shrub. Well, the native fruits are more nutritious than their invasive counterparts and also the birds depend on the multiple insects that you're gonna see so many more, multi uh, many more types of insects on native shrubs than non-native shrubs. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, you know, maybe I'll put in a sh native shrub or some native flowers. I just don't have the room though because it's already taken up with non-native species. <clears throat> so if you're wondering what to do with your non-natives, I'm here to tell you, don't be afraid to remove them because the rewards are well worth it. This is a monster Eurasian smoke bush. I call it a monster because I cut it six to 12 inches to the ground and every single year and it shoots up at least 15 feet. And I can't tell you how many compliments I would get on this thing. People would walk by, oh, I love the little smoke. Look at the little smoke. Can I have a piece of that smoke? But, you know, as the years went by, I no longer saw the beauty in this plant because I evolved to see the, the beauty in the plant is how much it contributes to the native biodiversity and this plant just wasn't cutting it. So out it went and I replaced it with <clears throat> a meadow sweet and a steeple bush, which I got last um, fall of 2019 from the West Cook Wildlands. The meadow sweet is Spirea alba, which is a white spire here. And the Spirea tomentosa steeple bush called steeple bush because it looks like a steeple and it has uh, little hairs all over the stems and the leaves hence the tomentosa part which means hairy spire so don't you think this is much more pretty than this monster smoke bush i do so these flower from spring to late summer they like wet soil but they can tolerate drier conditions supports 89 species of butterflies and moths. And what I found out was that there are multiple, multiple specialist spireas insects. So spirea moths, spirea flies, spirea beetles, spirea aphids.
but they also host non-specialist beetles like these soldier beetles pictures that I took. Um, and I learned that these type of beetles like flowers with small clusters like the spiraeas and also the goldenrods and sunflowers. And after I put these in, I was happy to learn that the Xerces Society labeled the spiraeas as having special value to native bees and they support conservation biological control because <clears throat> they attract predatory insects. You can see the dense habitat, the dense cover provides habitat. They tend to be deer resistant. And as much as I like taking these pictures and seeing these pollinators on the spiraeas, I was equally happy to know that the birds will eat these pollinators and feed them to their young. And those birds include the sparrows, indigo buntings, red-winged blackbirds, American goldfinch, and yellow warblers. So by September, the blooms are pretty much done in the shrubs, but the meadow anemone is still blooming. Now, under that monster smoke bush, I also had Japanese anemone. So I took those out and I replaced it with the North American variety the anemone canadensis or meadow anemone, which attracts bees, flies, and beetles. It causes GI distress, so I'm hoping the rabbits don't eat it. And it spreads by rhizome, so I'm hoping that provides some cover. But if you look, I put the Carex radiata here. Remember, every new shrub I put in, I surround by sedges. So I'm hoping these sedges help retain water and they also spread. So I've gone over some plants that provide pollen and nectar through the spring and the summer, and it's important to also provide that through late fall. So I'm looking forward to the fall superhero pollinator plants, and on my property that's the asters and goldenrods. And the asters provide nectar to the butterflies' long energy for their long migrations, and the bees need the pollen and nectar for overwintering. This picture I took here of this bee on an aster was very, very late in the season. It was almost November. And as happy as I was to see a plant still blooming in November, I was equally surprised and happy to see there's still insects around looking for nutrition. So I was happy that my yard had nutrition for them. So I will leave you with the re reminders to remember no fall cleanup, leave the leaves for overwintering insects, and leave your forbs standing for wildlife in the fall and the winter. Thank you. Wow, that was amazing, Candace. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to give us a little tour of your garden, and it's really splendid. So um, I learned a lot listening to you, um, and I am excited to share with you our next presenter, and, um, we're just delighted to have uh, Stephanie Walquist joining us today. Stephanie is co-founder and vice president of West Cook Wild Ones. A lifelong gardener, Stephanie has focused on native plants and animals since 2003. Her yard has close to 120 native species and she loves to share what she learns with her garden from others. Stephanie, welcome to our virtual garden tour. Thank you. Um, it's nice to be here today. I'm in uh, some very um, good company. So I, um, I am going to be focusing on my, um, my parkway garden. So there's a lot of interest in parkway gardens, I feel, in Oak Park and in River Forest. Um, so I started mine in 2015, and it's not really big. Um, so it's about four feet wide and about 12 feet, maybe a little bit longer. Um, by length and I'm able to get 30 plus species in there um, and it's become my favorite place. Um, so, you know, I, I've been focusing on this because again, it's pretty small. So just to show you that you can, you know, put in many different species um, and then have a lot happening, you know, over the whole season. So we'll just start here, you know, in the fall. Um, I have an upper left hand corner. I leave as everybody else has been talking about leaving um, my garden standing for all those reasons. Um, and another one I love is just the colors. Um, I think a lot of people just cut everything down because they start reading the browns as as this decay and they just want to get rid of it or that's what we've been taught to by standard um, 
by the standard uh, horticultural uh, trainings we get, you know, we, we're taught that everything has to get removed. And I feel that that's actually very counterproductive. Um, so everything's left standing. I get all these beautiful browns and reds and burgundies. And um, I just think it's really a, a beautiful time of the year. And I just, I relish in it. Um, and then I also know that those leaves will drop and they will go in and, and replenish the soil. And, um, make everything healthy for next year. Here's a picture um, in the middle here of the winter. And just to show you that, you know, it does, it can look, it, it, when the snow falls on it, it's a little bit tough, but um, after the snow comes off, the, the plants sometimes spring back up. But I leave that there because I'll get, um, I'll get dark-eyed juncos and other birds, cardinals coming through in there and they find plenty of food to eat. So it's really important as others have stated to, to be main, keeping these things standing. And they'll be looking for insects too. So there's always insects um, on the stems, in the stems, there could be galls. Um, they poke, they, they uh, pick those open. So it provides, you know, year round habitat. So, and um, on the right hand side, um, my garden cleanup is very similar. It's almost exactly what Adrian does. Um, so I leave everything standing until most of the leaves are off. And then I can make sure that there aren't any um, chrysalises out there, butterfly, you know, uh, pupae, uh, cocoons for moths. Um, praying mantis, um, egg casings. Um, so I know, you know, I'm able to protect that if I need to. If there's any overwintering bees, that also stays in the garden. Um, and I have places for different piles. If you look back where the, tr the, the chairs are, I'm not focusing on that garden, but I have a spot under these lilacs that came with the garden. And that's kind of like a place where I'll put my passive compost pile if I can't fit everything into my parkway. But I tend to um, place them in amongst the plants and they function as sort of a natural mulch and they break down and further enhance the soil. So having these, um, having these sort of heavier stems too uh, requires more fungi to be breaking that down. And the fungi create uh, relationships with our plants to the roots and they deliver water to the plants. They deliver, um, they deliver pest uh, control. Um, they deliver nutrients to our plants. So the more we can do to help provide, you know, food for fungi underneath in the ground, um, the better off our plants will be. Cause that's, that's a huge um, part. I think that a lot of us don't think about, we have to feed fungi um, through uh, the roots. So that's just a view of my garden. So just um, the right hand side that's closer to, I think it's a Norway maple a hybrid. Um, and so it's a little shadier at that end and then farther down away from it, it's still fairly sunny. So I, ha I get to kind of, I have a nice uh, spectrum of plants um, in that area. So towards the more shady section, one of my favorites is Jacob's Ladder. Um, probably a lot of you are familiar with that. Um, it's, uh, it blooms very early in the spring and um, it's nice. I love the leaves. Um, in front of it are the leaves of tall larkspur. We'll see that in a little bit. Um, and then just behind it, some Virginia water leaf. And then I have some sedges um, on the other side. So I just show this because um, right now the delphinium is pretty low so that the focus is on the, the Jacob's Ladder. And then over time, um, you know, Jacob's Ladder will uh, pretty much go dormant. You won't see it that much. And then other plants start to come up and um, take more center stage as the season progresses. Um, and I also want to show that even in our parkways, even these delicate, beautiful little woodland plants can also do um, really well. And my strategy to protect them is on this side of around the, um, the sidewalk, I have a little bit of a buffer of kind of a grass strip and then I have my sedges. Um, and I'll talk about the sedge later, but they tend to be okay with dog, like sometimes you have to talk about this dog urine um, happens, people let their dogs, you know, pee on the plants and stuff like that. So that is one of the hazards of having a parkway, but if you can kind of plant strategically and plant and plan for that as much as you can, it's a little bit better. So, um, so that's tucked in. So hopefully like if a dog did do something, it wouldn't get onto the, onto the plant. Um, this plant here, um, Adrian had mentioned the shooting star is super important. And it's also, it looks like one of those delicate orchids. Um, but it's, uh, it's turning out to be a pretty uh, hardy plant for our urban gardens. I really encourage you to plant that. It blooms April through May, um, and uh, it's very important for bumblebees. Uh, so, make sure, so if you have room and you want to you know, have a little bit more um, spring uh, blooms that are native instead of tulips and daffodils that don't really do a lot for our animals, um, I'd encourage you to start planting some of these spring ephemerals. 
And um, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, even I have some white trillium in that garden. And again, um, sort of in the middle, protected. The other plants are still pretty low. Um, so you'll see the trillium. Um, but as the trillium goes dormant, then everything else comes up around it. Um, in the middle here first, I'll talk about that. That is a Virginia water leaf, and um, I love it. It's a great uh, ground cover. Some people find it to be aggressive, um, so that therefore it's a great ground cover. It's also edible. Um, when the in the earlier spring, when the leaves are younger, they have these sweet little um, spots on them, and um, so I, I find like that also adds interest to it. And then you get these nice blooms. And um, this, the bee on the left-hand side, um, Heather Holm, who, from whom we've learned so much about native bees, I think she's really responsible for this like, huge interest in native bees. And we've had her speak at our conferences. Um, she identified that as possibly a Virginia water leaf specialist. Um, I can't remember exactly the species, but she thought it was one that specializes on, on Virginia water leaf. So, and I hadn't seen it before. And I feel like every year I'm getting different kinds of native bees coming back. Um, so as Candace talked about, you know, uh, having these, um, these native uh, plants do uh, such a huge service uh, to our larger ecosystem as we support these other animals that were here, you know, a long time ago and are trying to come back. Um, also, you can see right in here, I have burr sedge, which is a really um, fun plant. A lot of people like it. You can see the little, um, the seed head looks like a, a mace, a medieval club. Uh, and uh, that does a nice job in the middle. Um, I probably have to divide it soon, but I love it. It creates nice cover seeds for, for birds in the fall. Over on the right-hand side, um, so further down the other side of the garden, it's a little bit more sunny. I have started to put in some wild hyacinth. Um, that's another wonderful spring ephemeral. Um, it's a bulb and edible, but I'm not going to be eating any until I have a huge patch. But again, that's um, really essential for, for early pollinators and does really well um, in our area. And this is a fun uh, picture. This is a uh, smooth penstemon, penstemon digitalis, which I really love, would love for everybody to plant. It's a, it's just, it's really wonderful. It will do, it will do, I have it in full shade. Um, it blooms still, but maybe not as prolifically. It'll do great in full sun and it does great in part sun. Blooms early May, um, super important for our native bees. Um, and um, hummingbirds. And this one here, this was um, somebody who showed up last year um, and through iNaturalist, somebody identified it as an orange tipped digger bee. So this is a bee that um, will dig into the soil, maybe some rotting wood. So I always make sure I keep like little bits and pieces of logs around um, for my native bees that nest um, in cavities like that. Um, in the middle, which is a uh, kind of part sun, um, I have Bradbury's Monarda, which is a low growing Monarda. Um, a lot of people are starting to get um, very interested in this plant. We had our plant sale um, and it's just, it's beautiful. It blooms earlier than the other Monardas um, and it's low growing. Um, so, and it's, I need to plant more of it. It's uh, for some reason, um, the population has kind of declined a little bit. Um, so I, maybe some bunnies are eating it, but I, I love it. It's just, it's really important. I've covered in bumblebees um, in, the, in the spring and it blooms like May, maybe a little bit through June too. And then um, on the other side, I have this tall larkspur, uh, which is a native delphinium. And this is a darker blue one that I have. And it is always uh, visited uh, by northern golden bumblebees. Uh, which I'm really excited about. Uh, Northern golden bumblebees across the range are pretty much in decline. Um, and so um, I submitted a sighting of it to um, uh, the University of Illinois, what is, uh, it's called Bee Spotter. And they are really excited to see this species in Cook County. That it's, and I, I know Adrian has it and some other people have had it. And so it seems to be doing okay um, in our area, which is great. And then over on the right hand side, I have a pagoda, um, uh, mints, or it's also called downy wood mints, and this is another wonderful, beautiful species to have in the early spring, um, early summer, and um, it doesn't spread as aggressively as, when you hear the word mint, you think like super aggressive, but it's not really like that. The drought um, this summer we had uh, did hit it pretty hard, so I hope, I may have lost some plants, but um, it seems like 
wet with the rain, some of the, the foliage is starting to, to perk up. But um, I just, I love this plant. It's, and it stays low. So the other thing with the parkway too, is you have to select kind of lower growing plants. Um, so that's another reason it's nice to, to look at the parkway garden because a lot of times we hear native plants, we think of the huge, like 12 to 15, <laughs> the huge, the huge um, species. And this is getting to be a little bit later in the summer, still kind of early summer. And this is a lighter uh, blue um, color that I have for that, that delphinium. It's in the middle of the garden and does really well there. Um, just to the right in front of it, that's blue lobelia. So that's just kind of sitting tight until it's time to start blooming. So one of the things that's kind of fun is you watch the plants kind of sit, they stay a little bit shorter until they start to bloom and then they come up a little bit um, when it's their turn. So I feel like all the, the plants, they take turns, um, you know, stay low until it's my turn to pop up and shine. Um, and then this is another wonderful plant, uh, lance leaf coreopsis, starts blooming really early in June and I still am getting blooms now. Um, and I don't even deadhead that much because I like to collect the seeds and leave the seeds for my, for my bird friends. Um, and then just another uh, view on the right, so. And this is a nodding onion. So this is why it gets its name. Um, and again, this one does really well here um, in the parkway. I would love, I, uh, you could use it, you know, if you wanted to line um, your parkway, and it's also edible. Um, although I don't uh, dig up the, the the bulbs or anything like that, but I have used some of the leaves um, now and again in salads. And then here are the blooms, and again, it's always uh, being visited by uh, bumblebees. And um, in so right against it is the um, uh, aromatic aster. So that stays to about two two and a half feet. Um, but it does get kind of a nice mounding spread and we'll see it towards the end. So it, it stays, it, it has, it has a nice look to it, like a shrub look until it's in bloom and then it's just absolutely gorgeous. And I have a butterfly weed in that section too. Um, it seems to be pretty happy and I even found a caterpillar. A lot of times people feel that, uh, butterfly weed is not that popular with, um, with, cat with uh, monarch caterpillars, but I still, every year I find a couple of caterpillars in my butterfly weed. For some reason, butterfly weed is the one that I can most rely on in my garden. I'm uh, My uh, rose milk weed, I have a hard time keeping around. Um, something happened to my common uh, milkweed in the backyard. Um, so I'm really glad to have this uh, butterfly weed and it does really well in this spot. And you see on the right hand side, um, the Carex springli which I have lining um, the pathway. So I grew that from seed um, and that was one of the first things I planted. I, um, I learned about those from Pat Hill who spoke at one of our pro at West Cook Wildlands programs. Um, and I just love it. I do have to trim the seed heads um, right after it blooms because they do, it does get a little bit kind of messy and drapes over in the sidewalk. So I do try to keep it a little bit more tidy. Um, but, and I still, but I sprinkle, I keep the seed heads at the base of the plants. So they do happen to create seeds. I have little seedlings right there by the plant. Um, and then in the back, we'll probably focus on that in just a second, the starry campion, which I also learned about from Pat Hill. And this uh, Carex too, uh, again, if a dog pees on it, it doesn't uh, kill it outright. And there is the starry campion, which I just love. Uh, so this is a great plant if you have fairly shady conditions. This section does get some sun like for an hour or two in the afternoon um, and then it really wilts, these plants wilt, um, and, but they come back um, once the sun has gone over. So, and they bloom it's July, I think. Um, and I just, they're beautiful with their little frills and they're happy and they have nice foliage. And again, they're pretty much inconspicuous until they're blooming. Um, and then this is the far end over upper right hand corner. Um, I had a volunteer, a uh, false sunflower came in from another one of my gardens and I let it stay. And it's staying pretty short and I'm not sure why. This is the second year and I, I enjoy it. I think it gives a little pop of color. It took, it, it exploited a, a, uh, an empty spot and I just left it. I also put in some Monarda fistulosa because I have, I have that, um, that Monarda in one spot and I just, love it so much and the bees love it so much and so do butterflies so I just wanted to give it another place to go 
um, and it's kind of holding its own there. And you'll see there's some more nodding onion. Um, there was some uh, starry campion that was blooming in that section. Um, there is some blue stem goldenrod, just again, sitting tight, waiting for its time to shine. I also have some mountain mints and hoary vervain, uh, which is that light uh, uh, purple uh, spire there. And again, it's really important for our native bees and um, host plant for uh, buckeye butterflies. And that lower right hand corner just gives you a view of the garden from that sunnier end. And again, just packed with color, packed with plants. Um, so that I, the more that I, I mean, for me, I experiment because I want to try and see what these different plants are like. So, um, and then, so we know what to recommend. And I just, I just want to keep a lot of plants in my garden. I just love it. I just enjoy it so much. And I love that huge splash of color. And so then now the, this is getting a little bit later in the season, about September, and blue lobelia is like uh, a focal point of that sunnier section. Um, and surrounded, as you can see, by the fall sunflower, and just behind it, that white snake root, which um, I think Candace and um, Adrian had talked about. So it does self-seed prolifically. It makes its way to kind of empty spots in my, in my yard, and I leave it. Um, so it's, it's nice to know what the seedling looks like. It's easy to pull up in the spring, but um, if you have open areas, it will find it <laughs> and it will be there. But um, it's really important for uh, late season pollinators. And this blue lobelia, I just can't say enough about blue lobelia. Again, um, I will have all kinds of different bees on it, masked bees, bumblebees, the green sweat bees, um, the striped uh, green metallic bees. So uh, definitely if you've got a semi-shady moist spot, doesn't want to dry out, um, that is a great plant to have. And then on the right hand side, um, I have probably five or six different types of goldenrods in my yard. Um, they're really important. So Candace showed us the woody plants um, that are important for our Lepidopter species. The first herbaceous plant, the top herbaceous plant for supporting Lepidoptera, according to Doug Talamy, are, are our goldenrod species. So this is a nice one. Um, this one, if you have a hot, dry spot, not a lot of competition, this is gray goldenrod, it stays short, maybe two feet. I don't, it might get to three feet if it's a little bit happier, but um, it tends to like kind of dry gravelly areas um, and I just love it and I just even the foliage I thought was attractive and nice and this is the blue here is a uh, blue mist so again just starting to bloom now in September so so just give you some ideas right if your garden doesn't have a lot of color right now there's still there's still lots of plants you can get in there um, that is uh, again used by pollinators I will find monarchs on it um, in the shady and it will bloom in shade too I have some in a very shady situation um, and, uh, but it, if you go in full sun, it gets a little more aggressive. It's, and if you have like beautiful soil, moist, full sun, you might, it might get a little too aggressive for your taste, but I love it. And then I have still some of that snake root, um, sprinkled around. Oh, I didn't show a picture earlier, but I also have columbine. So you can see the seed heads there. Columbine was blooming more visible. And now the aromatic aster is starting to move in. And I also had partridge pea. And then this is um, some Drummond's Aster right there off to the side next to the partridge pea and still some wild petunia. So I get a lot jammed in there. And then there's just a little picture of a fiery skipper on that white snake root. And this is, um, this, I love this goldenrod. It is called uh, Blue Stem Goldenrod. I also learned about that one from Pat Hill. I think we had her come and present on Shady Plants. So I learned about Carrick Spring Alive from her, Blue Stem Goldenrod, and Starry Campion. Um, she wrote uh, Design Your Midwestern um, Native Garden. And so she was um, a great speaker um, a few years ago. And again, so just that, these beautiful spires of, um, Goldenrod, showy uh, brown-eyed Susans, and then um, also you can see to the left of the goldenrod is um, these purple flowers, which is New England aster, as uh, the others have mentioned. I um, in this um, Parkway garden, I prune it down pretty severely uh, before July fourth, so it stays pretty low um, and will still bloom. So if you if you do prune it down, and then it will. If you do it before July 4th, you still get enough time to, to set some buds. Um, and again, I place uh, the cut pieces down around the plant. So in case there are any pearl crescent um, caterpillars on it, they can get back to the fresh plants. And then this is getting to be pretty late in the season. Um, 
late September, early October. And um, the right hand picture shows the blue mist starting to go to seed. And this is where people might start cutting things down. And this I just still think is so beautiful. These, um, this dusty purple. And then as you can see, I start grabbing leaves off the street um, and I start putting them back on my, on my garden at the base of the plants. And if I can just put in a plug for aromatic aster, um, this aster is the latest blooming aster we have. And uh, it will bloom through early November. Don't really see a lot of bees on it at that time, but certainly through October, I think as like Candace may have mentioned and some of her asters. So this will still be getting visited by honeybees and native bees. Um, so I would love, and the reason honey, honeybees come here is because there's hives and not enough forage for them. So I really encourage everybody to help out our native pollinators and plant um, native asters. So I might have a few minutes. Um, I didn't anticipate having time, but I might just quickly go through my um, woodland garden. So here at the front, you can see the water leaf, Virginia water leaf, uh, wild ginger, which is a nice, beautiful uh, ground cover for the shady section. Um, early meadow rue is also starting to come up there. And then I have some maidenhair fern, which I think is just beautiful as it comes up. And I loved how it was capturing the light here. Um, Jacob's lighter just starting to poke up in the upper right hand corner. Uh, trout lily. So I want to put in a plug for a little trout lilies. Um, super essential um, early um, blooms for bumblebees, the bumblebee queens. They hibernate um, in the soil and leaf litter. They emerge um, and they have to start a colony all over again and they are just desperate for, um, for nectar and pollen. And this little plant here, hepatica, is doing great in these urban um, gardens. So again, another beautiful early season um, bloom for your woodland shady garden. Right hand side, uh, Dutchman's breeches. Again, another spring ephemeral. I just tried to plant some more corms I purchased and the squirrel dug it up. It made me very upset. So uh, something to be aware of, uh, maybe sprinkle some, you know, um, uh, I sprinkled some red pepper flakes after that happened, but it's, it's heartbreaking to plant it and then the squirrel digs it up. Uh, this is a fun one. Bellworts um, are also called Mary Bells. Uh, so these get, um, as they get more mature, they'll get some larger, um, these uh, larger uh, blooms. And on the right side, Toothwort, another spring ephemeral. And Celandine Poppy, which I believe we saw from somebody else. Uh, Virginia bluebells. Um, mine, I wish mine would get aggressive and spreading, but they just haven't. So I've had to grow from seed and start putting them in some different places. Um, Adrian had mentioned, or somebody had mentioned golden ground cell. So this is it in bloom, and I just love it. So golden ground cell is a great native um, uh, spreading uh, ground cover. And just here, like just a little bit at like nine o'clock, uh, plantain leaf sedge which is another wonderful uh, ground cover. Apparently it's like in danger, maybe in Indiana. And here I have some Carex with some wild blue phlox mixed in, um, some uh, Jack in the Pulpit uh, coming up, some little seedlings, they've made their way there. Um, and then some uh, wild geranium in the back. So I just love this little look. It's like a little woodland, like this little Carexes and the little wildflowers mixed in. And left hand is uh, red bangberry, and I'll try to get to um, the, the berries. Um, it's also called doll's eye. And another view of the phlox and the wild geranium. And a picture of pollinators are some mining bees visiting the golden alexanders, which is also the host plant for black swallowtail. So a lot of people find that on their parsley and their dill. Um, but if you have golden alexanders, you can um, move those caterpillars to that. And then I'm just going to... That's the plantain sedge. And I wanted to get to left-hand side is um, false Solomon seal. It's a new addition to my garden and I just love it. Um, this is a little bit of a sunnier section. And on the right-hand side is uh, hepatica leaves in the late summer and snow bells. I just, I, I'm almost out of time. So I'm just gonna go through very quickly so you can get an overview. Oh, so over here, um, this is again a shady garden. This is uh, late September, just to show you that you can have lots of activity and, and flowers still in the shady, shady season. Um, on this right hand, this is a shorts aster, which blooms so well in a very shady section. You put it to the back of your garden, 
um, but it's these lovely billowy light blue uh, flowers. And another view, that's that blue mist again um, of my garden. And this is calico aster, so these little, so this is it back uh, further in the back in the garden. And it's pretty inconspicuous. Some people might think it's weedy, but um, you just have this delightful spray of little small twinkling white flowers um, in the woodland. And then as you can see in the left hand, it's just letting it, um, the seeds go and start putting leaves back into the garden. Middle uh, section shows you the dolls, um, the doll's eyes of that red bangberry. And then um, some native foam flower, it pretty much stays like that all winter long. And again, covered with leaves and I believe that's it. Yep, and that's it for my, my show. Amazing. Oh my gosh, there's so much to learn. I feel like we could just do a whole program on spring ephemerals. There's just so many of them. And I feel like they're the unsung heroes of our gardens. And I really you know, feel like I could learn more about that. So um, huge, huge thank you to Candace and Adrian and Stephanie for taking the time to um, photograph and video your gardens and just to share a deep dive snapshot of what's growing and um, so we can learn from you. There are many questions people have been posting in our chat and um, I'm grateful to everybody who's been um, posting your questions there. I'd like to now introduce um, my partner in crime here, uh, Laura Hartwell Berlin from West Cook Wild Ones. Um, this team has been astounding to work with, um, putting this program together um, for months and months. Um, when we made the call to um, make it a virtual garden walk, we came together and, um, and had a lot of fun planning this. So Laura's been collecting the questions and I'm gonna have her pose them rotating to each speaker. So speakers, if you can unmute, um, we're gonna try to get through some of the chat questions and um, we'll just extend the time if we need to, to try to get to most of them. And we are recording this talk so we can share it with everybody later. Um, thank you. Hey, um, Adrian, Candace, and Stephanie, those talks were inspiring and your photography is wonderful. And thank you so much for your presentations today. Um, one question we have that kind of came up later um, during Stephanie's conversation and was partially answered in the chat, but I thought maybe we could address it to Stephanie and to Adrian and Candace if they have any input, is um, someone asked, what is the lasagna method? Yeah. Well, I, I think I, I sort of demonstrated it. Um, I do a basic, a very primitive form of lasagna method, which is uh, I, I put down about six or eight, I cut the grass closely. I put down six or eight layers of newspaper, but you can use cardboard, you can use burlap. Uh, and then I cover it with wood chips that I get for free from Oak Park uh, Municipality. And there's a ton now after the derecho, I will tell you, uh, which usually includes some leaf um, litter mixed in. Uh, and then you just let it sit. Now there's ways to get more elaborate with it if you want. You can add a uh, piece of wood chips underneath and then you can put um, some kind of smothering material on top and then you can put your wood chips on, on, on top of it. There's, there's different versions of lasagna. So maybe Stephanie, you have a different, different way you do it? Um it was pretty much like that. I just, I used cardboard. Again, I like cut, you know, I, the grass was cut cardboard. I moistened it down. And then um, I just pretty much started taking things from the people are like putting everything in the, in the street. Um, they even put brass clippings in there, even though they shouldn't. So I would just take some of that, take my little, my barrel and like go around and grab stuff. And then, so I layered that and then I had some mulch I put on top and I let that sit through the winter. And then by the spring, I just had this like lovely soil. I had, I didn't have to like do any digging or anything like that. It was super awesome. Yeah. Digging is not good because you want to keep the soil. You, you dig as little as possible because you want to keep the soil intact so that it can, um, work its own biological in its own biological way um, and you don't disturb the hyphae and the and the other critters so many of the questions we had were specific um to for example adrian um in your talk somebody wanted to know which service berry 
you were highlighting? Oh, um, that's a Melchior uh, Levis, smooth service berry. Uh, there's different varieties. Um, some are, are actually native to other parts of the US and Canada, uh, but that's a good one for this, this part of the world. Okay. And some have better berries than others too. Um, and someone in follow-up to that said that they have had a service berry in the area for a couple of years and while it blooms nicely in the spring, it doesn't leaf out that well and doesn't seem to be doing that well and wondered mm -hmm. if you had any suggestions. Uh, oh gosh, not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it could be any vari a variety of things. It could be not enough sun. It could be, depending on its, the variety, it could be not enough, uh, not enough moisture or too much moisture. You know, there's a lot of different, because there are different species uh, and different conditions and some are more adapted to other conditions uh, than you might necessarily have. Uh, so I, I I'm, uh, sorry. I know, that's, a, it's, that's hard. Um, and then Candace, there's some interest in your certification signs, what signs that you had and how to go about getting those. Well, I had to complete some documentation online for the conservation at home. And that was followed by a site visit with two specialists who came out and uh, had to give them a tour of my yard to show that I was doing all of the uh, conservation at home practices and then right then and, and then they're supposed to go away and decide and um, if you get the award but they said well this was the easiest yard we had to certify so we don't need to go away we'll give you your reward your award right here so they gave me my that sign right then and there so that was terrific and then you there's a another form you have to fill out for the um, um, Illinois Audubon Society as well and the West Cook Wild Ones Corridor sign is available to anyone who has native plants who wants to put their uh, signage out. So we do have those available. And like five or ten bucks, right? <laughs> yes. And also the Monarch Way Station, I believe you have to fill out a form for that as well, too. Um, and I think all of you talked a little bit about using leaves. Um, or leaving leaves during your, your cleanup. And we had a few questions about, people have heard that it's not good to leave leaves because you get moisture buildup or mold. Um, should you mulch them? Should you not mulch them? I don't know who wants to start with if that. You care, if you care about your lawn, which I do not, <laughs> um, you just wanna rake, gently rake them off of the lawn that you don't want the mold on. Um, I don't recommend mulching them because you're mulching the critters as well. So just gently rake them in a pile somewhere. Yeah, I, I rake them off the, off the lawn and then um, deposit them in various areas under my, under my bushes and uh, in the corners and wherever it seems like some leaves would be good. And it's really exciting in the spring. Uh, I have uh, a certain species of bumblebee that actually, like um, Bombus bimaculatus, they actually overwinter in my yard. And so it's always fun to see them. The queens dig their hibernuculae down into the ground and then they, to come, they'll like fight their way up through the leaves and kind of stagger around like drunks while they're trying to reorient themselves to the outdoors. And, uh, and, and I've seen, um, red admirals coming up out of the leaves too. So it's really, it's an interesting ground layer. And as for mold, I guess you don't want it on your grass, but you, that's the point, that's sort of the point of decomposition is you want fungus. Fungus helps to um, decompose various organic materials to make healthier soil. And, and, and you have fungus going all the way through your soil. That's what links the plants together, like Kansas was saying, plants like to live next to each other and they literally connect through the hyphae um, below the soil. Um, so fungus can actually be a good thing. Right? <laughs> yeah. I'll just say though, like um, I, 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 I've been doing this for so long that I wouldn't even mention or recommend it um, because it goes so against common, uh, common, I don't want to say knowledge, but common opinion. Um, 
but I'm confident that leaving leaves is like the best thing for your soil. I've done it. I, the plants have no problem coming up through it. Um, if like, say there's like six inches of, you know, plants, uh, leaves on a plant, I might move them off to the side, but that's pretty much all I do. And it just, just gets moved off to the side and it's just like a mulch um, and things decompose pretty quickly. Like by July, a lot of the leaf layer that I did have is gone. Um, it's been decomposed. So I, this whole idea that's going to create mold or unhealthy conditions, I just, I don't really buy. And I feel like um, if you have healthy soil, that's going to be disease suppressive. You're going to have all these organisms. There's, there are mites that eat fungi. There's, you know, there's, there's so much there that we don't understand. We have like, we just have such a limited view of what soil is. Um, when it's actually a living system. And if it's just like above ground, if you have things, if you have a lot of diversity in the soil, it's going to keep things in, in, in balance. And I encourage people to read books. This is, I'm not a soil scientist. I've, I've read soil scientists teaming with microbes. Um, uh, Life in the Soil is another one. I think we've got those books listed on our website. So uh, read about soil, you'll feel much more comfortable. And then um, one of those books too, I learned that uh, our shrubs and trees and perennials prefer fungally dominated soil, not bacteria soil, that's annuals and vegetables. And to get fungus dominated soil, you need to have whole leaves in, as, as the food for the soil organisms. Yeah, if you think about how healthy woodlands uh, operate, it's, they depend on that surface layer of what's called duff, and that's actually kind of pre-soil, and then it becomes, as it, as it decomposes, it becomes part of the upper layers of the soil in the woodland. And so leaves are, are crucial, especially under bushes and trees. I mean, they're, they are so, they are, and it's also the way that the nutrients, um, some trees, not all trees, some trees pull their nutrients back in, uh, but then some, like oak trees, I think, uh, maple trees actually, they dehiss and then the, the nutrients are in the leaves and, the, and so the nutrients go back into the soil uh, via the decomposition decom process. So you really want your leaves to be on the, on the soil because otherwise you're taking nutrients away from the soil and then you start needing or wanting to use fertilizer, which I haven't used in 25 years. So. Um, I just saw a quick comment about slugs because that's a common uh, problem. I don't have any problems with slugs in my landscape, and I think that's because I have so many soil organisms keeping each other in check. Firefly larvae are super predacious. They eat lots of stuff. Um, so if you've got, I mean, it might take time for that to build up, but uh, if you, I feel like I don't have a problem with slugs. I even got a couple of around. I never find slugs. I never see slugs, slug damage. No, me neither. Uh, thank you. So while we were talking, I saw a question pop up that is, I like. Um, please talk about the why we need to plant native times, native plants in a time when plants are available from all over the world. Why native? One it's almost Candace, Candace start. I <laughs> a lot last time. <laughs> well, I think our talk kind of address that. Um, I don't think talked about sequestration or... Yeah, okay, well, that's true. Um, I'll jump to that. People think of the Amazon rainforest as being so important for uh, carbon sequ sequestration and getting the carbon out of the air, but actually pr prairie plants the, in trees, like in the rain, rainforest, the carbon is held in the tree above the ground. So if it burns, it's releasing the carbon prairie plants, the carbon is held in their roots way underground, up to 15 feet below the ground. So um, when the prairie plants burn, the carbon stays under the ground. And they just do a great job of taking the carbon out of the air. So that's one reason, is to restore the... It's not a coincidence that the Midwest is, Amer is the world's best, most fertile bread basket. The farms went where the prairie plants were because the prairie plant roots is what made Midwestern soil the best soil in, on the entire globe. And unfortunately, we don't have any much of that left. So we're, since we can't restore the subdivisions and the farms that are out there, we could, and, and replace it back with the prairie, we could try to restore the prairie one yard at a time. That's pretty much the goal of uh, most of these native plant organizations like us is to 
get native plantings on businesses, schools, and ho individual homes to get millions and millions of yards with native plants to not only help save the biodiversity of the native species, insects, and birds, but also to help uh, sequester the carbon out of the air and help us fight climate change. And uh, that is one good reason to plant a native tree instead of a Japanese maple, for example. <laughs> um, yeah, and if I might add also, um, E.O. Wilson some years ago wrote the book Half Earth, and he said that uh, he's a noted entomologist and general all-star biologist. Um, that if we were to to put aside half the earth for nature, um, extinctions could be uh, avoided and our ecosystems would be in much better shape and it would even help with climate change. And lately scientists are producing studies that show even 30% of the earth would, putting it aside, would help stave off extinctions. Uh, and we can all do that in our yards. I think 30% half half of my yard is, is, is native. Um, that connects with other yards. Uh, Wild Winds is, made a, a, is making a corridor to go from Columbus Park, which has extensive native plantings, all the way to Thatcher Woods, um, which, is, which is native plants. And that actually makes the whole local ecosystem healthier and can help prevent even local extinctions. Uh, when I when I first started out, I never saw a goldfinch. I never saw hummingbirds. Uh, I never saw um, all kinds of all kinds of birds, and that have now that now frequent my yard. And and so I know that's that's a real that shows. And I know that um, Stephanie and Candace have had the similar experience. That shows that when you're doing this, you're actively helping knit together the relations that are so important in the, in the ecosystem, the relationships. So I'm gonna interject just for a second. We're about five minutes over. Um, how are we with questions, uh, Laura? Do we still have a few more that we can address? Um, we sure do. First, I would like to say that many of the questions were specific about I'm having trouble with this plant in my yard, and I think um, that's a tricky question for our gardeners to answer um, people's specific problems with their gardens, unfortunately. Um, so I just want to make a note to those people that maybe if you want to send us an email, we can try to help you more specifically with that. And also, um, Wild Ones is going to do a more informal, um, hopefully ask Ask Expert Gardener your questions session um, in 2021. Um, so you'll have an opportunity to get those questions addressed then. Um, and I wanted to see, I think I saw Kath Thomas mentioned in her comments, piggybacking on what you said, Adrian, about E.O. Wilson's work. Uh, could you just say a couple words about the homegrown National Park Initiative, which kind of grows out of that idea. Um, yeah, that's interesting because that concept actually goes back to the 90s to a book called Noah's Garden. And I don't, that was a book that really turned me on to, to the possibilities for gardening with natives. Uh, and it's, it's still a very relevant, great book. Uh, and now, um, oh, I'm blanking on his name. Um, ugh, God, uh, he's, he's picked up on it with um, oh, Doug Calumet, yeah. the national, national park is that if everybody plants their yards with native plants, you do form these corridors and you form these extensive areas that are much more wildlife friendly than you would have before. If anyone wants to add to that. Um, so somebody asked, they were um, a questioning about the wild ginger. They've heard that wild ginger is invasive and whether or not they should be planting that. Um, 
so native, so just to be like kind of um, a little picky about terminology. So native plants that cannot be invasive. Um, an invasive species is one that will go through and destroy an ecosystem. So when like Siberian squill escapes from our yard and makes her way into woodland, they like shade out everything else um, on the floor or honeysuckle does the same thing in our woodlands or um, buckthorn, those are invasive. So um, as a native species, it can't be invasive and it, it wouldn't even be really aggressive. I don't, I've, have you other one, Adrian, Candace? Uh, yeah, you have to, this is where it's really useful to start learning Latin um, because native ginger is a serum uh, canadensis and that's a specific species that's native to the North American continent. Um, I don't know what the Latin is for the non-native ginger, but, but it is, possible that that could be invasive. Same thing with honeysuckle. Uh, Japanese honeysuckle is invasive. Tartarian honeysuckle is invasive, Lomaseri species. American honeysuckle is not invasive. And so that's why, that's why. just learning some Latin and really Latin and really is, is, is what it's doing. Um, and then Ken is a really practical question for uh -huh. you was, do you plant your sedges at the same time that you put in your shrubs or do you wait for the shrubs to get a little growth and then plant the sedges? If I have them together, I plant them at the same time. Um, I, I actually talked to uh, wild ones about it would be a good idea to have sedges available at the tree and shrub sale because most of the time I planted the shrubs in the fall and didn't have the sedges until um, the following spring. So, you know, whatever, whatever you can do. I, now in the front yard, I had, I planted the shrubs in the front and put the leaf litter around it, which is great. But then when the spring came, the leaf litter was gone. So I use pine needles, which have very little to no nutritional value. So um, they're the, they're the, the pine needles are there to protect it from um, moisture from evaporating. And as soon as the leaves start to fall, I'm gonna take the pine needles out and replace it with the leaf litter. So that had been the plan all along. But like um, Stephanie said, the, all the leaves I put around it in the last fall, they were gone. They are gone. So I had to put the pine needles down. Any wrap up questions you want to throw out there, Laura, and then we'll, we'll try to wind down here. I so someone, at, oh, <laughs> go ahead, I'm sorry, Judy, I interrupted you. No, I just, I feel like we could go forever. We could go there. I have a lot of questions. I'm sorry we can't get to them all. Um, one is, is there a non-aggressive goldenrod? I guess. Well, you know, if you feel something is aggressive, you can just remove it. But on my property, by the time the goldenrods bloom, the insects really need it. So I'm happy to see them pop up. Like I, I didn't plant any in my front yard and now there's some in my front yard and they're, they're staying there. So um, other people can do what they want, but um, the later the season, the more important they become. So uh, I know people say that certain types of goldenrods are super aggressive, but I, I have not found that to be so far. Well, it, it also depends. There's some that are rhizomatous, like yeah. Canada goldenrod is, is, is so aggressive that some natural land managers will, will try to control it. Um, and zigzag goldenrod, which I love, is also rhizomatous, so it, it spreads rapidly. Uh, however, elm leaf goldenrod, which flourishes in the same shady conditions, is a clump former, and so it's not as aggressive. And so if you're concerned about that, it, it may reseed itself around the yard, though I've never experienced that. You may want to check, is it rhizomatous or is it clump forming? Because And it's the same thing with grasses. Uh, clump forming sedges and grasses will not spread nearly as much as, I mean, will, yeah, they'll, they won't spread as much as, 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 as rhizomatous. So that's, those are the two key terms you want to check. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I, Thank put, you. I put non-aggressive ones in the list. Um, so I, I, 
I love stiff goldenrod. I can't even keep it around really and showy goldenrod and this gray goldenrod. So they're a little bit more, they don't like competition. So I would try those. Um, there's lots. Those are beautiful goldenrods too. Great. Why don't I, um, why don't I wrap us up? Um, this was such a great way to spend a rainy afternoon, but I think it would be a great way to spend any afternoon because we just learned so much and it's rare that we can really have this deep dive experience with your, um, with these native gardens of yours. And so um, I'd really appreciate everybody who put the time and energy, especially our presenters um, for pulling this together. One of the things that we can do, Laura, is we can pull the chat out and we can actually go through, um, answer any of the questions and, and put it up as a Q and A on um, the West Cook Wild Ones website, maybe something like that. So if we didn't get to all of your fantastic questions, we can try to um, do some follow up with it. We also recorded this, so we will um, post the recording. And um, really uh, the ways that you can get involved, um, you can become a member of West Cook Wild Ones. Um, you can go, even if you're not a member, you can attend their free programming. Um, you can talk to other people, read some of the great books um, that are mentioned. Um, we might even have some more resources on the West Cook Wild Ones website. So really, um, that's a great way to kind of get more information. And then just talk to other gardeners. We're out here, um, you know, I'm on my parkway garden um, in the rain, in the sun, in, in most um, seasons, you know, we're out there gardening and that's a great way to um, get access to plants. Um, we also, Stephanie, we like that um, Oak Park River Forest Garden Club Facebook page um, where we find there's a lot of information sharing um, happening there too. So um, thank you all for taking the time to spend with us today and um, we're excited to see your gardens grow and hopefully we can do this in person next year. I Thank you so very much for all the information. Sure. Kalamazoo loves you. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, a nice turnout. Look at all of you. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Go to our website, westcook.wildones.org. Um, we have uh, Kathleen Garnis presenting about um, Dunesland, the Illinois Beach Dunes, next week. Laura, when? Yeah, next Sunday. Yeah, next week. Yeah. And, and, and join. Join the organization. <laughs> benefits. Yeah. And lots of really friendly people to hang out with, too. Garden geeks. <laughs> Somebody from Fox Valley. Yay. Bye, guys. A nice, nice variety. Mm -hmm. I saw Pam Todd was on here. Hi, Pam. Oh, yeah. Um, you still there, Pam? On. My daughter and her best friend uh, texted me. They were watching from their porch down in Kansas City. So. Oh, that's fun. Um, Sue Boyer is on with um, the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory. Hi, Sue. Thanks for joining today. I want to give a shout out from Pennsylvania. Ah! Hey, oh. my <laughs> friend Heather. <laughs> it was great. I learned so Thank much. You for coming. Can I ask my question real fast? <laughs> Go ahead. Is it okay to buy native plants at like non-native nurseries, do you think? Or what are your principles on that? Uh, I, I think mean, you just have to be careful that they are actually straight species and not native ours. Otherwise, yeah, I think so. And that they're not using chemicals. Yeah, like nicotinoids, a lot of big box stores. It depends who the grower is. I would, that's what I would look at. Who's the grower and do they use neonicotinoids or neonics? Um, but ideally, you know, like the native plant sales are your go-to or some of the smaller places. Like in this area, um, Natural Garden Natives supplies a lot of the Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay. But I would say if you, um, if you find that native plants are available at a garden center and they're like good native plants, it's great to buy them because it encourages them to buy more or sell more, I should say. So. There, I, I think there's a brand called American Beauties. Um, oh, yeah. They sell them in big pots, though, and I really like little, little plants to put in. I like little plants, too. Yeah. Easier. Mm -hmm. Hi, Laura. Thank you, Heather. Okay, it was wonderful. <laughs>
who knew we could take a, a virtual garden tour? <laughs> wow. It worked out so well because they were so like complimentary, but still mm -hmm. enough similarities. Yeah. yeah, you guys were awesome. Yeah, it was really great. It was, it was, it was really glad cool. to, As I was zooming through the woodland garden, was that too much? No. 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 Mm -hmm. All right, because I went faster than I thought with my parkway. I think based on <laughs> here, you know, we, we all we want to do is sit around and learn and talk about native plants. I mean, that's right because like I'm totally going to get some blue blue stem goldenrod. I mean, really, and shorts aster don't have them. I probably can divide up some blue stem for you. The shorts aster, I just I think I tried to move it a little bit, like just to because it doesn't it hasn't seated itself around. So I wish it would. Mm. It's just so I love it so much. Mm. It's not so I made the mistake of. Assuming it was short. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's not really. <laughs> Morning, in case anyone else made that mistake. So it's I a short. grass that completely died. And I just used my um, Dutch hoe and I, I just easily, it was almost like I could rake it off. So I was just oh, going to throw down some compost and I have all these plants I just ordered and some I picked up. So I, you know, I, the lasagna method, oops, the lasagna method, sometimes I'm impatient. So I'm still going to put my natives in, but I, and I've done lasagna. I've done the, I had my solarization and everything. So I'm hoping that I don't stir up, you know, too many of the weed seeds as I go about this process, but. That's a good, I forgot to bring that up, but mm. in that, the lasagna bed, you don't like have to deal with weeds. I never have to really deal with weeds. Um, yeah. And the leaves, I think, keep everything suppressed. Yeah. And mulching between, you know, when you first put your plants in, you want to put your wood chips down just to keep the, the weeds down a little bit. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I just, you know, it's like I, it was making me crazy looking at this um, section. And <laughs> um, I, my cup plants, um, I have these two massive six foot wide cup plants, and they completely toppled over from me too. after the storm. Yeah. So I actually had to cut them back because they like completely took over into the sidewalk. So, um, and I don't, I don't know where to put all those stems. So that's kind of my struggle is when I, when I do have like a mass takedown of something, you know, I don't really have that little space that you have, Stephanie, but I, I have like to chop and what was that? I love that. Adrian. Yeah. What yeah. is it? Chop and drop. Yeah. Chop and drop. I love that. I know. I, I actually, my cup plant I actually tied to the fence. I, yeah, and ours was tied to our front porch stucco, um, right. but the twine that I use, uh -huh. and the wind was so aggressive, mm -hmm. it, it blew and broke the twine. Oh, so, wow. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was a takedown for sure. So, Can you break the branch, like break the stems more and just place it around the bottom of the cup plant? To I have some. Yeah, I still have some. I know they're such, they like, they're like, those stems are crazy. Yeah. They're, they're like woody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it was just that there were massive, you know, um, six foot wide um, chunks of them. So, so, well, you know, as long as we, you know, keep taking those baby steps, I think that's been kind of one of the things that I've learned is that, you know, um, I think you said 80, 20, it doesn't have to be a hundred percent natives and, you know, my non-native plants, as long as they're not invasive, I think they still provide a pollinator. I have sedum and I'm pretty certain they're not natives, but I see bees crawling all over them. So I have plants that are pollinator friendly. Um, and so I try to get that balance just right. Yeah. I think I'm um, telling me his student, I forget her name. Karen. She studying. It was. I think it's Karen or something. Yeah, I can't. It was like they found like 70% natives were was ideal, like provided enough for it was they were focusing on some birds and they found that if 70% natives that provided enough forage for the for the birds to reproduce successfully. Yeah. Okay, so that's good to know. So uh, Adrian, I, I learned something from you, Adrian, which makes me happy. I around one tree I have uh, uh, Walker's low nepeta. Yeah. And uh, it's always filled with bees, but and it's one of the 
I've just hesitated removing it. But now I've learned that it can attract the honeybees to free up the other natives for the native bees. So yeah, I've, I've, I'm less less anxious to tear it out now. So thanks. <laughs> oh, good. I've I've observed that in my yard. I couldn't. I would not say that was scientific. I have not done a study. It's just what I've I've noticed over time. Uh, and it really, in my yard, I the, the there really is that early June lull. I don't know if other people. Have. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, I found out this year. I something I did not plant. Daisy, Eastern Daisy Fleabane. Oh, Daisy Fleabane, yeah. It came two in my backyard and one in, two in my front yard on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that was the best June holdover plant. Yeah. I, it's still in bloom, right? It's oh, in yeah. blooming right now. And yeah. it, it, one of the earliest things to bloom in May, and it's still in bloom now. Yeah, and it comes in by itself. I have it. Actually, the white snake root came in by itself, too, and then I just let it have the run of the garden, and it's another one you'd, I just pull out when I when I want to, and and I forgot to say, you know, where I have a row of nepeta, because I'm, yep. I'm kind of old-fashioned in that I like some garden design, so I like edges, you know, so I put the nepeta in the front, mm -hmm. and but in the back, I just realized, I, I, I didn't say I've got cup plant, obedient plant, brown-eyed Susan, Culver's root, willow, amsonia, zigzag, goldenrod, asters, and I just put in some camassia, which Stephanie mentioned. Uh, yeah. I have the, um, that cat mint, too, and I have it in a couple spots. It came with the house, and then um, it's like dog's pee. Like, I, have, I just have to, like, kind of do this defensive, you know, planting, so it's in a yeah. spot where if dog's pee on it, it's okay. Um, and I put it around the tree, so I can move some out, keeps dogs away. I, I don't know. Yeah. And it's my sister, uh, lives in, in one of those, um, townhouse developments where you're really under the thumb. It's all subsoil because they scrape all the soil when they build them and then it, it's terrible soil. And she had literally no bees. Uh, and so I took her a Mexican sunflower uh, and I put some nepeta, I divided my nepeta and put some in the front, and now she has bees, and nothing else will grow on that soil. So now I'm dumping wood chips on it. Every time I go visit her, I take a, a load of wood chips. So, um, so we'll get there. <laughs> All right. So, um, oh, yeah, go ahead. Adrian and, Adrian and Stephanie, I have a question. I, um, in the nepeta, um, which is in a big... Um, full of dirt around a tree is uh, one area where I have a uh, yellow jacket nest. And then I just noticed in one of my bird houses, I have another yellow jacket nest. It, it's the kind of birdhouse you could open up and, and clean off season. So I'm anxious to open that up. It is the, uh, like January a good time to do that? <laughs> It'll Probably. be safe, right? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and I, I did order some fake hornet nests to hang up <laughs> near my deck and near the bird feeder to try to, uh, Adrian and I discussed that this year there's a plethora of uh, uh, bald faced hornets. Yeah. And yellow jackets for me. So I, I love them in my yard, but I don't need them nesting right at my deck. So <laughs> the fake ones are going up. <laughs> I hope that works. There, there's been there's been bald faced hornets all over the place. I don't know where they all came from. I mean, no. We'll find out in the fall when the leaves drop, and you can see them in the trees. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm gonna um, wrap us up. up. You guys um, are amazing, and it was just a great way to spend an afternoon. And uh, I hopefully um, we we spread the word about different ways to garden and. Um, I will hopefully talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, oh, Candace, let me know too. Let us know how the how the cornet nests work. The face. And Definitely. Adrian, I would love to see videos of bees and red admirals emerging. <laughs> oh my God, I That's so hard to capture that. I know. <laughs> Have your phone with you. <laughs>